good evening. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the power that God had, Jesus had, over nature. And so, as far as the stories go, um, you're going to find out very quickly, these are my, some of my favorite stories. We're going to be talking about, really, the fishermen and Jesus being in water and, and asleep and, and the various different stories that we're talking about. And the whole purpose of it is to talk about his control. Now, we've been talking about um, miracles was brought up yesterday and what those words mean. And today, we're going to be talking about wonders. So you have miracles, signs, and wonders. Why would they call the miracles wonders, do you think? What was the purpose of using that term? What do you think? Why would you call something a wonder? Yeah, very good. So you have the, the idea that it's not the, necessarily the miracle itself, but it's what it does to the people. They were in awe. They were in wonder. So much so, as we go through this, they're going to talk about who can do this. What kind of man is this? And so when we talk about these wonders, we talk about these signs, we talk about the miracles themselves, it's amazing to see the reaction of the people. And that's really what we're going to be looking at today. Obviously, we'll talk about what Jesus does. So if you'd open your Bibles to Luke, the fifth chapter, is where we're going to begin. Luke chapter 5. So this story is in a couple of the different uh, Gospels, and there's going to be different pieces of it, but Luke's the longest, and it gives the most information. And so it's an interesting little story. You have Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, are in, involved here. And what was their profession? Fishermen. That's important as we go forward, because these are the same ones that are going to be on the boat, the next story we're going to talk about, that are scared to death. Okay, so we're talking about professional fishermen. They understand the water. They understand the sea. They understand fishing, right? So they, they certainly can get that down. So you begin here in chapter 5, and you, 1 through 3 is what we're going to start off with. Just 1 through 3. It says, Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing about him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Genesaret, and he saw two boats lying on the edge of the lake by the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats from the land. And he sat down and continued teaching the, book, the crowds from the boat. Interesting start of a story. What were the fishermen doing? I heard it. Yes, they're washing their nets, not to get them out. They're putting them away. We're going to see this in just a minute when Peter talks. But they're putting their nets away. They've been up a long time, right? And Jesus comes along, and what does he want them to do? Or what does Jesus do? They're sitting there cleaning their nets. What does Jesus do? He sits in the boat. I mean, I, it's my boat. It's over here. I'm cleaning the nets. And this guy comes and sits in my boat. Tells him to pull out a little bit. You just imagine the reality of that moment. What Peter was thinking about. What Andrew, James, and John were thinking about. Not necessarily this is the first time they knew who Jesus was or had met Jesus. But it's certainly an interesting situation. You can imagine they've been working all night. This one comes up to them in verses 4 and 5. And what does Jesus say to them? Let's get back out there. Put out into the deep water and let your nets down for a catch. All right? Peter explains what had happened so far today. And what does he tell them? Or what does he tell Jesus? very nice how how did they work does it say all night hard work when you go fishing or when i go fishing it may probably not could be considered hard work right they went fishing it was hard work this was their livelihood we're gonna catch these fish and they caught no fish how do you think that went over for fishermen it's horrible that's absolutely horrible. 
Now you have this guy. It's been a long night already. It's hard work that they were doing to just wash their nets. And he says, hey, let's just get on out of here and we'll go catch some fish. All right? Peter had a choice to make with the others. Well, okay. Wait, this has been a hard night, but I will do as you said. We will let down the nets. Mark? That's correct. He certainly was not in their minds. He was not a professional fisherman. That's right. They'll learn a little bit later on. He's, pr he's pretty good fisherman. Now, if you study commentaries, there's various different views of this, but one of the things that was interesting about Jesus saying this is that they would normally use the nets close to the shore, so in the shallows at night, because it was easier to catch them. What does Jesus tell them to do? Go deep. Go into the deep water and cast the nets. So you think about if that, if that part is what happened, you think about from Peter's standpoint now hearing this guy saying, okay, now you want us to go into the deep water and use nets to catch these fish? We're not going to catch any fish, but I'm going to do what you said. I'll go ahead and do what you say. And so that's exactly what he's going to do. They go out, they cast the nets down, and what happens? What happens? Okay, they caught so many fish in an area that allegedly, as they'll say, potentially were, would have caught none. They had no thought of catching fish. This obviously was not the area they were just fishing. So he catches all these fish that they need help bringing the fish up. And then you have this wonder of what happens. What does this cause Peter to do in Luke's account? This is the wonder. What does it cause him to do? He falls down at Jesus' feet. That is an amazing thing in verse 8. But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knee, knees saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Why would he say that? Why would he do that? There might be a wonder there. Why would he do that? Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. These fishermen who knew what a normal catch of fish was, they knew how to fish. You just imagine, as any of us are in a situation where somebody comes along and tries to tell you how to do your job type thing, you have the situation here. This man is telling me I need to go out. They may have met him before. They certainly, um, depending on Matthew, Mark, or, or Luke, there, there were other instances where things could have happened between them. And he certainly, as he's standing there, says, look, I'm, I'll do exactly what you want me to do. We're going to go out there. But the amount of fish that they caught was such a miracle to Peter that it causes him to say, I am a sinful man. I should not be in your presence. That wonder that occurs to Peter is the exact same thing that should occur to us. When we read this story, but we read this story sometimes and we think it's just like a kid's story that, oh, they're going to catch full of fishes is what they're going to be talking about in the back classroom. When the reality is this is an amazing miracle of God showing his power so far over nature. And you have this part right here that is so interesting because when we go to the next story, it's even more of a wonder what he's able to do with nature. He was in control. Jesus was not just sending them out there hoping that they were going to catch fish. He knew exactly what was going to happen. And that's obviously the amazement in verse 9 talks about of what they see. It's, it's an, I use the term awesome a lot. This is true. This was an awe-inspiring moment for them. It was amazing of what they were seeing. livelihood of these men if they pull up this amount of, of fish right from from their selling point from their using um, fish to make money and to take care of, of, of their families and think about them pulling this up and how from that standpoint just from that standpoint they haven't left yet we'll get to that in just a second but just from that standpoint what it would do for their families what it would do for the situation they just got and decided that they had not caught anything it was such hard work you imagine how sad and lonely and disappointed they would have been, and now all of a sudden, 
their boat's about to break. And they caught all these fish. And what's their reaction? Well, what does Jesus tell them, first of all? That's the red part of verse 10. What does he say? You're going to catch men. right? You're going to catch people. Do not fear. I want you to remember that phrase as we go through these stories. Do not fear. Verse 11, what do they do? This is such a powerful story to these men. What does it say that they do? Leave everything behind and follow him. This story certainly can be in other things that occur, and there's, and there's various things that happen. When a rabbi would call people to follow is a tremendous honor for them as well. But they left everything and followed him. This one is different. This man, this one that were before, we found the Messiah, as Andrew is going to say to Peter. And so it's amazing to think about all the stories and how they all come to fruition, but the ultimate response is they follow him. They leave everything to follow him. Jonathan? His response reminds me a lot of Isaiah's when Isaiah has the vision and he's just, I'm, I'm unclean. You know, you, you think about that perspective and just this idea of seeing this one and the power that he has and I'm before him. And I just witnessed this amazing thing, as it says in verse 9. I have to, you have to get away from me. I, I, am, I am not worthy to stand in your presence. I am a sinful man. That is absolutely correct. From a human standpoint, you just think about it from that standpoint, the, the humility that must have hit him, hit all of us, to understand what Jesus was able to do, who he is, even for us today. That's why we talked about yesterday, the idea that we're all going to bow before him. When that day occurs, we're all going to bow before him. Whether we're confident or not, we're going to bow before him, because he is the great I am. He is God. And the, the power of that is just awesome, and you certainly see that here with Peter. <laughs> yeah yeah no <laughs> that's, that's a good point jesus would have made a great fisherman partner yeah that's but yes you're right that this is the beginning of some amazing work that's going to be done and you also see by the way we, we talk about peter we'll talk about james we'll talk about john this is also with andrew i mean they're they're all so important when we're talking about the apostles and what they're going to do some of them are mentioned more obviously but it's amazing to see how all of them uh, did things but we're going to be focusing a lot on peter as we go forward with this uh, it's, it's fascinating to watch how he handles things sometimes we'll talk about that he speaks too quickly and sometimes he did but you see his heart you see how sincere he is he was willing to go out you know it's it's amazing uh, these men and, and their their faith that you're seeing it being built right before your eyes as you read the scriptures It's it's pretty awesome to be able to witness that so anybody else on this story Good I want to get to this one then. Matthew 8 All right Matthew the eighth chapter is the calming of the storm. It's a story that we all know Especially if you go to Mason, I talk about it a lot. But it is a powerful, powerful story. And how the scriptures describe this is an important thing for us. Okay? So they're in this boat. Again, who's in the boat with him? Jesus is in the boat. Who's in with him? The disciples. That would have included the fishermen. They understood the sea they understood what was going on they understood the weather to what they were able to do they had been in situations i'm sure similar to this however this description of this storm is important for us to understand so jesus was obviously tired this is one of those stories that you see the 100 percent man 100 percent god piece he's asleep he is so tired from all that he has been doing he lays down and he goes to sleep what begins to happen how does the scriptures define or describe this storm in verse 24. 
what's your version say? Okay. Oh, great temp. All right. Somebody else's? Furious storm. Okay. Anybody else's? Violence. Okay. So there's different words that we'll use, right? We sing Master of the Tempest is Raging. You have these different uh, songs that we'll sing that have used these words to describe this. In Greek, this is earthquake of a storm. That's what the literal phrase is, an earthquake of a storm. So these guys are in this storm that is so violent, okay? And it's interesting how it's worded in verse 24. It just developed on the sea. It's so violent that it's described as an earthquake of a storm. Earthquake of a storm. They're on the, in the boat. And what, does, what starts happening to the boat? It's covered by the waves. It's absolutely being covered by the waves. And what's Jesus doing? That's hilarious. It is covered with waves. And he is absolutely asleep. This is not a cruise ship. Okay? He certainly would have known, or if he, he would have felt the, the water, I'm sure. It's not a huge boat. And so you think about it from that standpoint. Jesus is asleep on this boat with these men who are scared to death. And believe me, I would have absolutely been scared to death too. There's no question about it. I wouldn't have been on the boat personally, but I, I absolutely would have been scared to death of a certain storm that's called an earthquake of a storm. There's no question about that. Now you see the difference of the responses. What are the... So, Jesus is in a boat with them, and what do they come over and say to him? Save us. Why? We're perishing. Other parts we'll talk about, other gospels say, what does it add to it? Does anybody know? It's a Jeopardy question. Do you not care? Jesus is in the boat, right? So if the boat is destroyed, from a human logic, it would tell you that Jesus is going down with it. Right? But they come up to him and say, we are perishing. Do you not care that we are dying? They're scared to death. They're absolutely scared to death from what's going on. They understood that Jesus was the one to wake up. He was the one that could save us. Didn't know how at this point. But you just think about it from that standpoint. Man's response was they were scared to death, and deservedly so. What's God's response? He's 26 in the beginning. He doesn't calm the storm yet. What does he say to them? You have, <laughs> you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? You can imagine that the waves are still crashing against the boat. They're getting hit with water. The wind is blowing. And he says, why are you afraid? What would your reaction be to that? The storm. The storm is what I'm afraid of. Oh, you of little faith, he says to them. What does he do? What's he say? And he didn't have to talk to it, but he does. What does he say? Peace be still, and the other ones. He rebukes the wind, as it talks about here in Matthew's account. He rebukes the wind and the sea. And how does it describe what happened? Complete. Completely calm, perfectly calm. We've talked about this before. I got a feeling that they probably wanted some wind, you know, if you're trying to get somewhere, but it becomes perfectly calm. Can you imagine? Imagine that second. It was absolute, a violent storm. They were getting knocked around, wet. I mean, you just can't even imagine. They were so afraid that the boat was going to be destroyed. They were going to die. And next thing you know, quiet, nothing, nothing. In my opinion, and this is just my conjecture, Jesus goes back to sleep because I think that would be hilarious in this story. But that's, you think about from that perspective, Jesus rebukes the storm. He had not done this. It was one thing to bring out the fish, right? That's an amazing power to show his control over nature. But this takes it to a whole nother level that the same people that saw the fish story or saw the fish account, what do they say now? Who is this? Who is this? This is the guy that brought some fish up, right? Which is an amazing thing. It, it caused Peter to be, I'm a sinful man. You have to stay away from me. 
He was amazed and they were in wonder. And now you have the same men that are in this boat saying, who is this? Who is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? It's one thing to be able to heal somebody. It's another thing to bring somebody back from the dead. It's one thing to bring a, some fish into a boat, which is awesome. It's another thing to stop the wind, to stop the sea. Who is this? And the next thing you know, the guy's going to be walking on the sea. It is amazing the wonder that these people would have seen. It, it, it's truly awe-inspiring. And these are just the ones that we know of. I mean, you imagine what this was like if there were three years that they were with him and what they saw and what we're able to read. And this can't just be simply one of those stories or any of the stories that we read about that you just kind of just go through it. I mean, you think about this story. Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? You have little faith. Can you imagine when we're in situations very similar to this? Jesus, do you not care what I'm going through? Why are you afraid, Scott? Why are you afraid? I'm with you. You're okay. In the understanding of what's going to happen. What kind of man is this? This is the Son of God. And the power that he is showing is just awesome. Rachel? It's an interesting, yes. And the reality is, that's a, he said, it, or is he sort of telling him, do you not know who I am? Well, that's exactly what we do, right? Do you, <laughs> we call ourselves, profess to be children of God, and if we get so worried, so concerned, so consumed by various things, and he says, do you not know who I am? Am I not your father? Am I not the creator of all things? Am I not the one who's going to save you? And bring you home to be with me for eternity? Why are you afraid? What are you so afraid of? This storm, and I've talked about this so often. I love this storm because the men are scared to death. God, this is nothing to him. This storm is something he's going to stop. Jesus stops it here. But he was asleep. This amazing storm was so powerful, so scary to the men, and Jesus was asleep. He has amazing power. This was not an issue to him, for him to be able to stop this storm. But the astonishment of man is what we need to understand. What kind of man is this? It's the same thing as you read this. We should have the same reaction. You may not feel the boat rocking. You may not feel the waves hitting. But this is the exact same God we serve. And what he is able to do for us, we should find uh, comfort in that. And that's why you ask the question, uh, what kind of man is this? Right? I mean, it's, uh, it's powerful. He became perfectly calm. I just, just to see that would have been so, such an interesting thing. He goes on, and you see the story of the pigs, of what he's going to do, and you still have these same words about being violent, extremely violent, and various things that are going on, and Jesus just stops it. He just stops it. His power is just so awesome to the point that it didn't even matter that it was water. You know, when you think about Matthew, the 14th chapter, and you're talking about Jesus and the story of him walking on water, I understand the disciples. They have seen so many amazing things that Jesus has done. So many things. Jesus goes away from them. He tells them, I want you to go to the other side. And what does he go and do in 23? He went up and prayed. And the scriptures, interestingly enough, will tell you because he, he was alone. And so uh, in verse 23, he went up and prayed, and it was evening. He was there alone. He was there alone. Pretty awesome. This isn't about a prayer service or a prayer class, but this is pretty awesome. Our Savior goes up. He's had, obviously, a lot of things that have occurred. This is leading up after uh, what we talked about last night with the feeding of the 5,000. John the Baptist was beheaded. He goes up to the mountain. He's praying, talking to his father. 
Everybody else is going to the other side. And he was alone, as it says in 23. Now, you have this boat. It's already a long distance away. Some would say it's three or four miles off the coast or off the shore. And what begins to happen to it? This will sound familiar. <laughs> you think they stopped getting in this water. The long di- they were a long distance and battered by waves for the wind was contrary. So it wasn't an earthquake of a storm, but it wasn't very calm either. So you imagine, again, you're looking out and you're seeing the waves. You feel, obviously, the wind. And what do they see? What do they see? I want you to think about this. Do what? Absolutely. They see a ghost. That's exactly what you would have thought you saw. There's no thought of a a man that is walking on this water. It's got to be something else. The scriptures will indicate to us that the the description was that they, they thought they saw a ghost. And they yell it. It's a ghost. Right? You think about And they're scared to death. They're crying out in fear. Terrified, it says. The description of the disciples. And we can read this, and it can kind of make you laugh. I absolutely would have been the loudest screaming this at this moment. I mean, you think about seeing something that you've never seen every day, or a lot, so often, so many days, they would have seen things that Jesus did that you never would have thought of. You talk about doing things that are beyond all that I can imagine or comprehend. And I look out, I know he can stop the, the storm. You know, I'm not afraid of that anymore. But now he's walking towards me, or something's walking towards me. And they're scared to death of what's going to happen. And what does he say to them? Be of good cheer. Take courage. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, as he always says to them. And then you bring old Peter involved in the story. And what does old Peter do? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. 28 is a very interesting verse. Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Well, if it wasn't him, what was going to happen? Yeah, Peter was going to distract him. Yeah, it wasn't going to go well. If it is him, Peter's the second person ever to walk on water. That is awesome. We always talk about what's going to happen to Peter in just a second. He walks on water. I've seen people try to walk on water. Jacob, my son, tried to walk on water one time. It ends exactly the way that you thought it did, or you think it does. That's the difference of looking out and seeing somebody walking across the sea. And people have tried to describe this as, well, obviously it was frozen, and so he's walking on ice. No, no, just because you have trouble understanding God or what was going on, it doesn't change this wonder, this miracle. They were walking, he was walking on this water. He absolutely was walking on this water and walking towards them, and they were absolutely scared to death. Peter says, if it's you, command me to come out there. And what does Jesus say to him? Come on out. Verse 29, when it says, and Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. That is awesome. We'll go to verse 30, and that's important. We'll get to that in just a second. Verse 29, where were the other disciples? Still in the boat, exactly where I would have been. Still in the boat. Peter, they look out, and not only do they see Jesus, they see Peter walking on water. He's walking on water towards Jesus. That is amazing that he is able to do that. Now, you get back to what truly matters of this story. He takes his eyes off of Jesus, and what happens? He sinks. He begins to sink. And that's the interesting thing um, of this story as we go forward. And this is sort of the application that we'll get. What does he yell out? Save me. Save me. Verse 30, as it's described, he saw the wind. He became frightened. And when he began to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Now, application wise, we get caught up in verse 30 all the time. All the time. You take your eyes off Jesus, 
and you put anything else before it, you see the wind, you see the things that are contrary, you see the things that you don't like, sink. You begin to sink. That's what happens. That's what we do. We've seen it a lot in the last year or so. Okay, this is something that we can get caught up very, very quickly. Jesus immediately does what? Saves him. Immediately he saves him. How does that look? Just pulls him back up, just says, or thinks it, it comes back up. What I love about this in verse 31 is we never find out how he gets back in the boat. They get back in the boat. As soon as they get back in the boat, what stops in verse 32? The wind. So this whole time that Jesus is saving Peter, the wind is still going. It's still all around. But I guarantee you, Peter wasn't yelling, Lord, save me anymore. Because he was in the arms of Jesus. Jesus had saved him. But what does Jesus say to him? Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? When they get back into the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are truly the God's son. You are truly God's son. Time and time and time again, you see what they were able to do. The power that our God shows, simply by doing things that, you know, he was asleep, he stops the wind and the storm, he's walking on water to get back to them, he, he saves Peter when he's going down into the water, and this wonder occurs, and it causes them to worship him. This is important for us from that perspective. If we lose the wonder in our God, it will be seen in our actions and certainly in our worship. We've got to understand the power that he has and what he is able to do and what continues on. He has absolute control. Every time of the stories that we looked at, he tells them, do not be afraid, and in one way, shape, or form says, believe. Have courage. Do not be afraid. There's a reason why he says that, obviously. The response to Jesus' miracles, who is this? Who is this man and that he's able to do these things? Absolutely awesome. John. Absolutely right. That's, and I, I think from an application standpoint, that's how we tr try to look at these stories. There's, it was a, obviously a, and a need for the moment of the time of, of the disciples' lives and what it teaches them. There's no question about that. And, and it's the power for them to learn. But there's tremendous application for us to understand what this means. The significance of him doing these uh, miracles was not just simply to show that he had power to walk on water, which is amazing, but he had power. And what he's able to do, and the questions that he would ask are the same questions I think he would ask us. You have little faith. Why do you doubt? Why are you doubting? It, you're okay. Peace be still. I'll, I'll be with you when you're going through these difficulties. That's the interesting part. That's the, that's the important part for us to understand from these stories. There's a lot of lessons from that standpoint. The, the idea of, of him being willing to get out of the boat, the others not getting out of the boat, the, the fact that, as we've talked about, you take your eyes off Jesus, this is exactly what's going to happen. When we're going to begin to sink, as we would talk about. But Jesus is still there. He's still there, and he's still able to, to save us if we're willing to allow him to do that. And it should motivate us, as verse 33 does, to worship him, to worship our God. And to be sincere in our worship of him and the power that he is able to have. So you think about these stories. The fact that he was able to do this with these catching of the fish. You think about him being in the boat and he's asleep and this amazing storm comes along. And he just stops it. 
And then obviously the walking on the water. But to me, the most amazing part is that Peter does. Not because Peter, wow, it's amazing Peter does. Jesus has Peter walk on the water. He is able to help him to get onto the water. He's watching him, and then he saves him in this situation where he's still standing on the water. And then they get back into the boat, and the wind stops. You can imagine the other disciples saying, oh, I was just about to say, I'll come out there, but you're already back, so there's no need for that. But it's, it's just truly amazing to think about the, the story and the control that he has. Why do we worry so much? And that, that's not an easy answer. I mean, I've asked some easy questions that took a while to answer. This is not one of those easy questions. Why do we worry so much? Why are we so consumed by things if we really believe that Jesus, that God is in control? Why? Oh, ye of little faith, why do you doubt is the reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. The, the lack of trust that you have. It's also, when, when the Bible says that, G, that God is able to do beyond all that we can imagine, all that we comprehend, we've talked about this. There are some amazing adults that have some wonderful imagination. Right? I mean, it's amazing what's going to happen in this, in this country. It, it, their, their minds, you just, they have all sorts of ideas of what's going to happen. Their imagination, we, we take off on those things. Children have imaginations. We think, we think it's neat. When adults still do, it's, you may have to grow up a little bit. But when you think about it from this perspective, that's the danger that we can get caught up in. You get so caught up and consumed by all these different things, and it never dawns on you that Jesus is able to do beyond all that I can imagine. So whatever I can imagine the worst case scenario is, whatever that is, God is in control. Either I believe that or I don't. That's the trust piece. It's easy for me to say, well, I would have got out of the boat. There's no chance I would have got out of this boat to walk on the water. That's what's so amazing to me about Peter. But you think about it from that standpoint in our lives, we have to get out of the boat when you're making the application. We've got to be willing to, to do those things and to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. That, the wind's not an issue unless you focus on the wind. And that's, that's how it describes it here about him. He took his eyes off and started seeing the wind, started seeing the, the waves, and then he becomes frightened. Continuing on down the road of what's going to happen when they're finally going to understand who he is, the power that he has. Uh, yesterday morning we talked about Colossians, the first chapter, and you think about him being the image of, of God and, and, and that perspective of him and how awesome he is um, and what he's able to do. That's the idea that we need to have. So when we talk about Psalm 23, and you talk about all these different passages that talk about he's going to be with us through the valley of the shadow of death. He's going to be with us through all these things that we go through. We have to believe it. We need to grow. And it is a growth. But to Brian's point, which I think is so valuable, sometimes we get past something and we don't acknowledge that it was God that helped us get through those things and we just worry about the next thing that's coming. And then we don't stop and realize that's how I got here to begin with. I, I was able to get through that last storm of life. He's going to help us through those things. Doesn't mean they're not going to happen. That's not the, what we're talking about. What it means, though, is that he's going to be with us. And if he's able to do this, you imagine all the things that he's able to do. And, the, and these stories are awesome. Don't get me wrong. But God's power is beyond all of these things. It's not, this is not uh, something that this is the best that he possibly could do. We're talking about the God of, of all power. And so it's, it's so important for us to understand his power and whether or not we truly uh, have that relationship with him. We'll obviously uh, continue tomorrow night talking about Jesus. Thank you.